Good afternoon, everybody. Can you hear me? My name is Gordon Flake. I'm the CEO of the Perth U.S. Asia Center. Uh, and I wanted to start by first and foremost expressing our, our tremendous thanks to the ASAN um, Institute for Policy Studies for hosting us today and for being such a vital partner in this project as we, we've done it over the last two years. Uh, we are here today to discuss uh, the second in two annual reports uh, of a network of think tanks in the Asia Pacific looking at America's role in the Indo-Pacific. Uh, many of you had an opportunity to attend a similar event we did in September of last year up on Capitol Hill, um, and uh, I'm delighted to see the level of interest that uh, exists in, in the room here today. Obviously, there's some added interest given the fact that this is the first multi-country survey of public opinion done uh, almost simultaneously throughout Asia after the election of President Trump. Um, we've assembled today a panel uh, of experts to help us kind of think through some of the conclusions. Unfortunately, um, we don't have hard copies of every report for the full audience here. We do have for those who, if you have a Luddite card or if you're over 65, yeah, <laughs> I wasn't looking at you, Chris. Yeah, yeah. We, we do have a few at the end of the meeting that you can refer to, but what this, the report is available online at the U.S. Studies Center website, I believe at the Asan Institute website, as well as the Perth U.S. Asia Center website, and some of our other partners as well. Um, and again, in just a minute, we're going to hear from the principal author of the report, uh, Simon Jackman, a little bit more about the methodology and some of the core conclusions in there. But I would start off with giving a little bit of context. The intent here really was to put together a number of organizations in the region that were not driven out of Washington, D.C., both in terms of how the questions were framed uh, and, and how we looked at developments in the region, how the U.S. itself and its role was perceived in the region uh, as a network of think tanks in the Asia Pacific, or in this case in the Indo-Pacific, uh, as we focus on it in that process. Um, I would note uh, with, without going into too much detail, uh, just to give you a couple of highlights that I thought were particularly interesting, and, and our panelists are going to talk about some of the others. Uh, if you go online in the website itself, you'll find there's a heavily graphic version of itself what is an executive summary of the report. Um, but it, we, just to give you a, 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 just a taste as we kick off, we would ask questions like, you know, which country has the most influence in Asia today? Um, and and again, Simon will go into some greater detail on this, but this was done in, in late February, early March of this year. And, and you get a sense for how each country responded uh, in terms of where they ranked the United States, where they ranked uh, uh, um, uh, China, and in the case of India, where they ranked India in that process. We also look forward to ask questions like, which country will have the most influence in Asia in 10 years? And again, uh, we've got a colleague from India who will help us understand this, but tremendous level of confidence in India, which is we always love to see self-confidence, which is good. Uh, and then if I would just focus on one just to give you kind of an early kind of peek at some of the data, this one I find very striking. It's a simple binary question, which is, the, you know, uh, do the United States' best days lie in the future or in the past? Um, and if, for many of you looking around the room who work on alliance uh, relationships, it's quite striking uh, if you look there that the core allies of the United States in the region are, are you know, actually more pessimistic than China is or India is about the United States. So only 19% of Japan thinks the U.S. best days are ahead of it. Only 23% of Australians think the U.S. best days are ahead of it. Only 26% of Koreans think the U.S. best days are ahead of it. And again, to put this in context, this was largely before the, the, the floor fell out of the post-World War II liberal rules-based international order. Uh, so you know, it would be very interesting to see next year kind of how this, th these, these numbers hold up. Uh, India here is a real outlier. So again, I just put out those three there just as a way of, of um, give you a sense for the type of data. The other thing I would note in that, that we think is unique in this project is that rather than have a single report, what we've got is we've got country-specific chapters, which gets you analysis from a Japanese perspective, a Korean perspective, uh, an Indonesian perspective, a Chinese perspective and an Australian perspective uh, of the same basic data set because different countries in the region are going to find different things of priority, of interest. So today, uh, I'll take just a moment to kind of introduce kind of a, a panel in the process. We're going to first turn to Professor Simon Jackman, who is the CEO of the United States Studies Center at the University of Sydney, 
Simon is the principal author of the report. Uh, spent 17 years at Stanford before moving to his current post at, at the University of Sydney at the U.S. Studies Center, uh, and, and is a, a world-renowned uh, you know, pollster in his own right, and so really was the, the intellectual heft behind, be, behind how the, the, the survey itself was, was framed, the questions, the, the companies we used, the methodology, modalities, et cetera. And in the, the report itself, both online and here, all that's in great detail, and I'll leave it to Simon to talk about that. After we hear from Simon, uh, I think rather than try to establish any kind of hierarchical order of countries in the region, and it's not based on the survey, we're just going to work on, on the geography of the table, we'll turn to Darshana Barua, who's with Carnegie India. Um, yesterday, Darshana was with us launching a book where she wrote a chapter on realizing the Indo-Pacific task for India's regional in engagement, and she's kindly agreed to do double duty. Um, our partner in India was Brookings India, uh, and uh, again, there's no competition, I don't presume, between Carnegie India and Brookings India, but we're happy to have Darshana here to kind of give a couple of insights on the data that she finds interesting from an Indian perspective. Uh, and then third, we'll hear from James Kim. Uh, as all of you, I think, know, particularly in this room, uh, the Asan Institute for Policy Studies has carved out for itself a tremendous reputation and role in doing public opinion surveys in Korea. And so really, from the very beginning, uh, you know, Asan has been one of our core partners in this enterprise based on their expertise, and we particularly benefited from having James both last year and this year, and he'll kind of look at it from, uh, from the Korean perspective in that. And then we have a repeat performance. Uh, last year, uh, when we did the event in, in, uh, in, on Capitol Hill, uh, Yuki kindly stepped in and, and um, helped us kind of look at the, the, the data from a Japanese perspective. Yuki Tatsumi is here in this building on this floor here at the Stimson Center um, and, and actually has a, a fellowship at the Canon Global Institute and they were our partners for the Japanese side this year. And then last and certainly not least, we're going to turn to Yun Sun who's also here at the Stimson Center. Uh, she was kind enough to do this last year and, and so she has a chance to kind of look at some insights of what it might have changed between last year and this year from a Chinese perspective. So that, by way of introduction, is kind of where we are. Again, we have f select copies of the hard copy of the report here, but I do hope that you will actually dig a little bit deeper into the data itself. In addition to this printed executive summary, which is available as a PDF, uh, the U.S. Study Center has actually put out a lot more of the data, and they've actually done some very interesting audio visuals as well. So let me pass. Oh, you've already got the clicker. I do. Uh, back down to Simon. I'll turn the time over to Simon for kind of the initial layout of the report. Thank you, thank you, Gordon. And uh, just at the outset, uh, let me also add uh, my thanks uh, to Asan and, and to James and um, for hosting us uh, technically the first time on premises, but, but very instrumental in, in putting uh, an event together uh, for the first iteration uh, of this work here in Washington. Uh, uh, Gordon and I are, are lead uh, think tanks headquartered a long, long, long way away from here, and it's um, fantastic that we've got the support of, of Asan, who have an established, uh, very established, uh, very, very nice uh, DC presence uh, to help us uh, present this work uh, to an audience like yourselves here, here in Washington. Um, I also um, owe a debt to, to, to Gordon. And, and his staff from, from, um, from the Perth US A Asia Center. Um, G Gordon um, uh, has built this network um, of, of, um, of think tanks around the region uh, to come to the party, as it were, uh, to invest in and support uh, this, this survey, this project now, uh, uh, two iterations of it now. Um, and, and, and very much has, has really, if you will, project managed um, the entire uh, enterprise uh, from, from beginning uh, to end, uh, and, 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 and it's not over, right? It, it, it's an ongoing project, um, and we hope to stand this up again <coughs> uh, in the next 12 months or so, do another iteration of it. Um, so with that out of the way, let me, let me turn to some of the, some of the results, um, and, I, and I'll just clue you in. Um, to the design of the study as well. I think that's an important sort of thing to establish from the get-go. Um, this is, as, I, as I've alluded to, the second iteration of this project. The first time we were in the field in, in, um, in late 15, early 16, and, and we've come back into the field um, uh, literally about six weeks into the, um, into the Trump presidency, 
uh, six to eight weeks into the Trump presidency. And there are um, six countries surveyed this time, uh, Australia, China, India, Indonesia, Japan, and South Korea, with, um, with India being the new entrant uh, this year. So there's only one year's worth of data um, out of India. But as Gordon has already alluded to, uh, some really uh, interesting results um, coming out of the India data. Um, they're generally very positive assessments of the United States, uh, really literally jumping off the page time and time again over, over, the, uh, over the body of the survey results. Now, what's interesting about this survey is that uh, the survey content is, is almost identical up to the vagaries of translation um, uh, across all six countries. Uh, there are a few exceptions, obviously, asking uh, uh, Chinese people about the influence of China on China is, a, is, is nonsensical, so we don't do that, and there's a few, right, but, but in many other places through the survey, we're putting direct com you know, directly comparable uh, questions uh, up, and you'll see that in the presentation that I've got of some, I've cherry-picked a few results to share with you, uh, and, you'll, and you'll see these, these comparisons across the countries, about countries, time and time again. Um, we repeated many items, moreover, from the, from the previous time we ran the survey, and that puts us perhaps a little uniquely um, to generate some before and after comparisons, public opinion in the region, um, back when I think, um, uh, if you'd asked a lot of people who was going to be the next president of the United States, um, uh, a lot, most people, frankly, were saying um, um, it would be uh, Hillary Clinton. And, and, and then we go into the field where that is not the case, um, and, 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 and President Trump is the President of the United States. And so we have this interesting intervention, if you will, um, um, to, to that, that, that separates the two surveys. Um, I won't talk about it here today, but another thing we did um, was to insert a, a question wording experiment into the survey itself. Now, this is something that's done all the time in commercial polling, uh, in, in, in product testing in message testing and political campaigns as well. That is, a random half of the sample gets a version of the question that is just slightly different. And in this case, uh, we asked people um, to assess the influence of the United States uh, on their respective country over the next five years, except that a random half of the sample got the words, now that Donald Trump is president. <laughs> um, and. and um, and, and, and this is sort of just to give you, this is sort of relates to sort of some of my big takeaways from the survey. If in Australia, but not just Australia, in, 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 and, in, and the pattern that Gordon alluded to, it's really among American allies in the Asia Pacific, uh, in, in, sorry, pardon me, in the Indo Pacific, that, um, <laughs> that, that this, what I'm about to report, holds up. Explicitly cueing respondents um, that Donald Trump is president will produce a marked fall in assessments of the extent of and the value of American engagement with, with, with their country. Um, you get that similar fall 2015 to 2017 in the absence of a cue of Trump, but explicitly cueing Trump can produce, in the case of Australia at least, almost a 30-point increase in negative assessments of the United States' impact uh, on Australia. So, and that sets the tone for a lot of what I'm about to show you. But, and here's the but, when you get into domain-specific realms, if the conversation turns from a global assessment to a more policy-specific assessment, defence, trade, investment, the numbers start to come back a little bit. Right? And in particular, in, in certain domains, and, uh, and I, I speak with most authority on the Australian data, um, when it comes to investment. Australians are, are rather unambiguous as to which country they prefer more investment from, uh, the United States over China. For Australians, trade means a surplus with China. Uh, it means a deficit with the United States. So when it comes to trade, um, 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 Australians have a, uh, uh, a preference for increased uh, trade with China or increased trade with the United States. But when it comes to um, uh, each, uh, an increased military presence for the United States uh, or China in the Indo-Pacific, 
Australians there too are rather unambiguous in their assessments about which country they'd like to see a greater um, uh, military presence from. Uh, and, and the answer, of course, is, is, is the United States. So although at a very high level, at a very general level, a rather abstract level, an almost shoot from the hip type response, um, particularly given when we were in the field, March, and for Australian respondents in particular, the, 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 the so-called Trump-Turnbull phone call was, was very much still um, in, in many Australian respondents' minds. Um, queuing Trump per se will produce you know, uh, 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 an increase in negative assessments. But I think it's important to focus on on what else is going on, and, and, and this is a, it's a long survey and, and a not insubstantial report to accompany the, the data. Um, there is much more to the story than just that very high level, rather general and almost unthinking um, uh, reaction uh, to, to waving Trump in front of uh, respondents around the Indo-Pacific versus engaging respondents in domain-specific, policy-specific realms of the various bilateral and multilateral uh, relationships between the countries. So that's one big takeaway. And now let's uh, take a, a slightly closer look. Um, um, so, so this is showing, this, this bar chart has a lot of numbers on it because there's a lot of data here. We've got, uh, the survey was administered in six countries uh, in, and, 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 and at least in five of those countries, we've got the same question asked uh, in, in, two, in two years. We asked countries, um, which, this is the, the item Gordon alluded to, which, which country has the most influence uh, in Asia today? And you can see the before and after. The blue bar shows the most recent data, as I said, fielded in those uh, first months of the Trump uh, presidency uh, relative to uh, the, the survey we administered late 15, uh, early 16. And you'll see that, uh, say, let's just take the Australian data, uh, you see... Uh, 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 the, the proportion of Australians nominating the United States as the most influential country in Asia falls from 22 to 11. Uh, China, goes, China goes up a little bit. You can see that pattern go, uh, holding up uh, in, in various other places. Chinese respondents um, um, less likely to nominate uh, themselves, slightly, uh, uh, actually, they're, they're going against that pattern. Um, but you'll see if we go to Indonesia, uh, you'll see a fall in the proportion of respondents nominating um, the United States. Japan, the fall is, is, is quite profound, and I was really struck by that. I, I went back to the data over and over again to make sure that wasn't a mistake. 48% uh, nominated uh, uh, the United States, uh, late 15, early 16. That fell to 14%. And, and what's really remarkable is the big step up in, in Japanese respondents nominating themselves um, as, as, as the most uh, influential country. Um, and, and then finally in Korea, 60% um, uh, uh, of Koreans nominated the United States when we asked them this question in 2015. Um, in, the, in the opening months of the Trump presidency, uh, just 31% of Korean respondents nominated the United States as the most influential country in Asia and a big step up from 35 to 60% um, in, in the proportion uh, nominating China. Um, so some big changes are, are right there. Um, when we ask respondents to assess is, is, is the influence of the United States on their uh, country uh, positive or negative, generally positive assessments outrank negative assessments. But what's striking, uh, to me at least, again speaking to the Australian data, only by eight points in Australia. Right? The proportion of Australian respondents saying, uh, all things considered, the US is a net positive, positive assessments those respondents saying on balance positive versus negative, the positive respondents outnumber the negative assessment by only eight. Uh, in Indonesia, that's plus 44. Indonesia, plus 15. Japan, 30 points. And, and Korea, 19 points. It's, it's really quite striking and says something about um, a long-running conversation in Australia uh, about the relative merits of bilateral relationships with the United States or China. Um, that see these numbers in Australia, a, a, a long-standing staunch ally of the United States uh, for that number to be, to be plus eight and, you know, a little bit lower and you wouldn't be able to distinguish it from zero, statistically speaking. Um, only in China um, do negative assessments of U.S. influence um, are more prevalent and by, by, a, by a massive 45-point uh, uh, margin. Um, the change, um, 2015 uh, to 2017, 
is, um, is, is, is quite large. Uh, it's, again, it's fallen by half in Australia, 16 point net positive to 8 point positive. Huge fall in China from barely, essentially zero, uh, to massively um, uh, negative assessments outweighing positive assessments. And you see those, that big fall in Korea as well. Um, and, and the Japanese assessments, though, aren't, aren't, aren't changed. We can actually do the explicit head-to-head. -head. We, we can ask respondents um, 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 which country um, uh, has more influence um, or, or more positive influence uh, on your country. And, and we, we can identify respondents whose response when we ask about the United States is more favorable than the response when we ask about China or vice versa. And in Australia, essentially, there's this incredible even-handedness um, that, that most Australians, if you do that head-to-head, -head, will give you the same, they'll give you the same answer. Well, not most, but it's the, it's the plurality outcome. Right? It's the modal outcome. 40% of Australians will give the same rating if you ask them about Australia's relationship with the US as you're asking about Australia's relationship with China. Right. Uh, and then, and then the, re the rest split essentially 50-50. 30% say the U will give more positive assessments of the US, 30% more positive assessments of Australia's relationship with China. That's not a sensible comparison to do with China. Uh, in India, again, you see this overwhelming, uh, uh, overwhelmingly positive ass assessments of India's relationship with the US relative to India's relationship with China. So it's 52 to 18, 31, giving uh, the same response. Indonesia, uh, again, a very even-handed uh, set of responses. China, perhaps slightly uh, dominating. Japan, it's not even close. Uh, the, you know, marked preference um, for the uh, for relations with, um, with with the United States than with Japan, and 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 a similar sort of lopsided pattern in Korea, not quite as strident as as in as in uh, Japan. But you'll see that those numbers, uh, indeed, if anything, have increased um, uh, 2016 to 2017 in the Korean case. 57% uh, of Korean respondents falling to that more positive towards the U.S. than they than they are to China, and, and the, the proportion of Korean respondents um, giving more positive assessments of the relationship with uh, China uh, than the US, falling from 19 to just 10. Um, I mentioned some of this domain specificity, um, and, and so let's get into some of that. Trade and investment. Trade with the United States is generally seen as positive, um, and again, on these head-to-heads, uh, Japan, Korea, India, um, uh, prefer increasing trade with the United States uh, over increasing trade with China, but the opposite holds true in Indonesia and Australia. And, and again, in Australia, there's a reality-based component <laughs> uh, to that. Uh, Australia has a uh, trade surplus with China and a trade deficit with the United States. Um, uh, when it comes to investment, though, uh, it's unambiguous um, across all countries. Uh, there's a strong preference um, who, who, uh, foreign investment, um, if it's coming from the United States or China, most, uh, every, uh, every country, uh, a majority of respondents prefer um, investment from the United States over investment from China. And, um, and we also, this is an issue in many countries. It is, a, it is a big issue in Australia, foreign investment in critical infrastructure. And we explicitly reference things like the electricity grid, water, um, um, uh, telecommunications, um, 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 their foreign investment um, in, in those sorts of things um, is, is faces more opposition than support in Japan and Korea, but especially in Australia. That is a, that is a rather hot button issue in Australia. And, 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 and typically, and I don't think it's a stretch to say this, most Australians parse problems with foreign investment in critical, critical infrastructure means China. Um, that is uh, Chinese investment in, in, um, in, in that aforementioned list of, of, of critical national assets, but including increasingly in Australia um, a debate about agricultural uh, holdings uh, as well. Uh, and and I'll, I'll skip over that there. The, that's the underlying data. Um, this was interesting. We, um, we asked just in this year's iteration of the survey uh, a fairly standard question that appears in, uh, this is fairly canonical in uh, public opinion surveys in the United States at least, how you ask about, this is sort of a, a standard uh, set of words for how you ask about isolationism. Um, uh, this country, 
the respondent's country, would be better off if we stayed at home and did not concern ourselves with problems in other parts of the world. Um, um, uh, and we just report here the percentage of respondents uh, agreeing with that proposition. China has the lowest level of agreement um, with that proposition. Just 18% of Chinese respondents uh, agree with that proposition. Um, India, uh, half of Indian uh, respondents agree with that proposition. Australia, it's 43%. And, uh, and you can see uh, the other countries, Korea, 23, Japan, 30, uh, Indonesia, 26. Um, really marked uh, difference between, say, um, Indian and Chinese public opinion, and, and indeed, uh, again, Australia, an interesting uh, uh, set of data uh, there as well. Um, um, it's important to stress this. As, as you can see, the survey does not just talk about sort of general abstract things. Um, it does not just focus on security. Uh, there's, a, there's a lot here on trade and other aspects of the various uh, relationships uh, among uh, countries in the Indo-Pacific. Here, in the, in the wake of, of uh, the demise of, uh, perhaps permanent, perhaps not, uh, the demise of TPP, we thought it was uh, helpful to include a question about attitudes towards free trade agreements. Um, um, and it, what's interesting here is Australia racks up uh, one of the highest levels of opposition uh, to free trade agreements. To be sure, it is only 20% of Australian respondents report outright opposition. Um, that 12 plus 4 plus 4, but compare that with China, um, where it is 3 plus 2 plus 2, right, or se just 7% of, of Chinese respondents report opposition to free trade agreements. Um, um, but uh, but it's, it's Australia, a, a trading nation, um, that, that has uh, the, the most uh, uh, opposition uh, to free trade agreements, or, or, or at, at least, right, the same as Indonesia, <laughs> also on 20 points. Um, but but that, that's, uh, that's rather uh, uh, striking as well. And you can see, again, the, the sort of enthusiasm uh, for free trade agreements. Uh, the high, if you sum the three favourable bars out of the Chinese data, uh, you, get, you get quite a, and, and India for that matter, uh, you can see some, some marked differences uh, in, in, in those data across the countries. Um, this has been attitudes towards democracy or assessments of the importance of democracy as a form of government. This is something that has attracted uh, quite a bit of interest around um, the, the world of international public opinion, if you will, in, in, recent, in recent years. And again, there's a, a fairly standard um, question wording that's used here, and that is to give respondents a 10-point scale where they self-assess the importance of living in a country that's got democratic forms of government. How important is it to you that you live in a country uh, that has democratic forms of government, that is governed democratically, might be, might be the English version of the, of the, um, of the question wording. And uh, democracy is a little bit like motherhood, but not quite. Um, um, a lot of people just go straight to the 10. They, want it, they max out on that scale, right? Except when they don't, right? And, and that's the interesting sort of variation in these data. So, so Almost everywhere, uh, the exception being uh, Indonesia, 10 is the modal outcome. Right? But what's interesting is the extent to which you get that tail back, uh, that, that respondents are, are willing to put a number other than 10 uh, on, on, the, on the value um, of democracy. Um, and, and what's interesting here is that um, in Australia, uh, despite that very high number, you'll see that there's a, and we'll see on the next graph, that who are, who are our non-10s? Well, if we plot the data by age, um, you'll see this interesting pattern that, that Australia is not alone in this. You see this pattern in Japan as well, that it's younger generations, younger respondents, do not kind of almost quasi-automatically jump to the end point of that scale and give democracy the highest rating they possibly could. Right? To the extent you're seeing a bit of equivocation about the value of democratic institutions it, in, 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 in Australia, it's coming from younger people, right? and, and particularly in Japan, where the, among the, the youngest Japanese respondents, the most likely response is a six on a 10-point scale about the importance of democracy. India, it's eight across the board. Same thing in Indonesia. Korea, there's not much variation over, over age. It's largely eight, 
maybe eight and change uh, among slightly older respondents. And, and the one country with an inverse pattern uh, is China, where the most enthusiasm for democracy uh, is, is that average of an eight among uh, the youngest Japanese respondents and then uh, Chinese respondents. And it's when we get to those essentially pre-cultural revolution aged Chinese respondents that you'll see democracy only getting so-so ratings, uh, struggling to break um, a seven among, among the older uh, respondents in the uh, uh, older uh, Chinese respondents. Um, so that's as much detail as I'll show right now. Um, it, the survey ran about 20, 25 minutes. There's a lot of content there, uh, more than I could possibly go into right now. Uh, I, I talked about the Trump question wording experiment. There's also a set of items there about national stereotypes that are just fascinating data. Uh, uh, we, uh, on average, uh, are Japanese people intelligent, hardworking, moral. Um, we ask those questions. Each country is asked those questions about themselves and about all the other countries in the data. So you've got all these um, many, many comparisons on, on three or four uh, ethnic stereotyping dimensions to look at. Um, truly fascinating data there. What's especially fascinating is to measure what we call ethnocentrism. That is the tendency of any nationality, any ethnic group, to rate their fellow co-ethnics highly over other groups. Um, that is a standard behavioral pattern in, 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 in human psychology. Um, we tend to rate co-ethnics higher on, on anything, except when there are exceptions. And um, um, Australians do not see themselves as hardworking as their Asian neighbours. <laughs> Indonesians do not think of themselves as intelligent as their, as their neighbours. Um, um, would anybody like to guess of the six countries which is the most ethnocentric group of respondents in the data? Sorry? That's correct. Yeah, yeah, that's right. And, and, uh, and, and, and by a substantial margin. Uh, and, and, and so those data are, are talked about uh, in, the, in the report as well. Um, but uh, as, as Gordon said, uh, the report uh, exists in, in very, this is a very rare document, um, but, but it exists in, in PDF form. Uh, on the website of the United States Study Center and, um, and at Asan um, also uh, has it as well. And I'll, um, I'll leave it at that. Thanks, Gordon. Thank you. So now, with Simon having kind of laid out the detail, we're going to ask uh, each of our other panelists to kind of give kind of short, pithy assessments from uh, an Indian, Korean, Japanese, or Chinese perspective of what you found most interesting uh, in the survey and the data. So we'll start with you, Darshana. Um, thank you, Gordon. Um, India, yeah, so 44% of Indians believe that U.S. has the largest influence in the Asia-Pacific, um, more than the rest. Uh, I think it has a lot to do with also presence, what you see around your borders, South Asia, Indian Ocean region. You see American presence, Afghanistan, Pakistan. In the Indian Ocean region, you see, in, uh, you see really India really considers outside of itself America. U.S. is the only other prominent player in the region. So I think that's what reflects and also influence has for, for India. I think it's combined with presence. But on the ground, I would, I would be interested to see the results next year because there's definitely some, some ambiguity uh, seeps in after the election of, I mean, uh, with the current president, um, with Trump coming into power. And uh, it, has, it, has, it has kind of seen American presence as shaking. At no point India wants to see American presence reduced. But it has gone to the point that maybe India is starting to wonder that if in, if uh, U.S. changes its mind on its presence or influence in the uh, in its neighborhood, what would India have to do? Um, I think one of the interesting things is that uh, in 10 years from now, which are the countries that would be most influential? And India was the only country who said, I think, itself, and then U.S. and China. Uh, that is the re-emergence of the notion and the debate in India of, again, becoming a great power. That was something that had declined in the recent past, and it's coming back up with the new government where India wants to see itself 
play a greater role and be uh, be uh, be a great power. And I think these sentiments have been accentuated by recent developments and incidents. The Doklam incident, which happened, was definitely uh, something that uh, that would probably accentuate this uh, the sentiment. And India wants to see itself stand up to China and be uh, be that country who really puts it down in the in its immediate neighborhood at least. But at what cost? I I don't know. India has really thought that through. Um, I think uh, the most interesting part for me was that 52% of Indians uh, believe that U.S. does more good than harm because the Indian government is definitely moving ahead with more agreements and collaborations with the Americans, but there's still a huge level of suspicion and mistrust when it comes to India-U.S. relationship. It's definitely moving forward because it has stalled, but it, I mean, it's, it's taken a lot for India to get to this stage, but there's still some concern and doubt in India about um, U.S.'s role or U.S.'s commitment or friendship toward India. So that is, so for me, that was interesting. Uh, what does not shock me at all is that 71% of Indians are in favor of Trump. Uh, I think it is, it was, it is the, I mean, India has a big fan base in Trump in India. I mean, when he came to power, there were people celebrating and, you know, it was like a festival in some parts. But that, that, that idea is divided because I think a lot of the, a lot of the respondents who, um, who, uh, who are in this group are also because of Trump's Unfortunately, under Trump's stand on uh, immigration and, with, and Pakistan, you know, because that influences India's views heavily. So uh, India, Pakistan, I mean, the relationship is something you don't want to, nobody wants to see Pakistan on any table that India is on. So it, it's something that uh, Trump was here saying, like, you know, okay, we're not a friend of Pakistan, we'll be a better friend of India. So that was something that was, uh, that, that was the least, uh, um, uh, surprising part for me. 14% believe that India should develop a partnership with China, which is very low, and which actually highlights the mistrust that is keeping in, in the India-China relationship. India and China's relationship is, it's the, the mistrust is really deepening. India doesn't want to, it has to, you cannot stop engaging with China because it's that big neighbor right next to you, so India will have to engage, but it looks at everything that China does through suspicion. It does not want to stop trade, it does not want to stop talking. When Prime Minister Modi came to power, he has made his efforts into engaging with China, but it has not worked. And I don't think so. As in public domain, they do not want to see much goodwill with China. There's not much. Um, the last point, which I think goes back to the first one, which was that Indian, Indians are split 50-50 on its international role, because you know 44% of Indians think that they want to, that they see uh, that uh, 10 years from now, it's a, itself is one of the great power, but at the same time they're split in terms of India's role in the international um, order and the, the isolationism of uh, point. I think that leads to that kind of comes from the fact that India wants to be at this big power, big power table. It wants to contribute to things that are happening, and it wants to be one of the foundational pillars of this new emerging security architecture, but it does not want to be the global policeman that America is, that it does not want to be the global power in the way that the United States is. So India's view and India's concept of a global power is really different from, I would say, how other countries maybe look at themselves as the global power. China's is much more aggressive and much more hostile. And um, India's would be that, you know, it sees potential in itself that it can go up and it can really make a difference. But it does not want to be that one country taking on much of the responsibility in doing it because it will come at a cost. And I think that's where this division is from, um, you know, where we see ourselves taking a lead in the next 10 years, but we're also divided on the kind of roles that we want to take. So those are my quick points. Thank you. Um, can I have the flicker, Simon? So um, thanks, Gordon. Um, it's always nice to, um, we were very happy with the, the results of the second survey. Um, I think the, um, um, the data, there, there was, there's a lot there, as Simon had pointed out. Um, it's always nice to work with good partners um, and um, like the U.S. Study Center and the Perth U.S. Asia Center. Um, and, um, and, and others that have also kicked in. Um, 
I also wanted to just you know, put a little shout out for the Stimson Center. Part of the reason you know, um, that we can do this um, uh, as on, as largely because the Stimson Center works as a really great partner um, in hosting us um, um, here and, and also providing some of the, sort of the institutional support and the, and the intellectual firepower um, when, we, when we need it. And, and it's, it, this, is a, this is a luxury that not, not many um, um, uh, South Korean organizations uh, can boast having, um, and largely that's largely because I think a lot of the help that we get in, in D.C. from, from Stimson and, and Brian, um, Brian Finlay, um, um, who runs a really tight ship around here. Let me just um, highlight a couple of things about um, the South Korean data that we found very interesting. And as um, um, Simon pointed out, nicely, um, there's a rise in um, um, sort of negative sentiments uh, about China, but then there are also negative outlook about U.S. influence um, in the region as well. And um, yes, the election um, in 2016 was uh, very important, but there were some other things that happened um, uh, late 2015 um, throughout 2016 and 2017 that I think influenced um, um, this data set. And I, I think you need to be aware of, um, in, in South Korea case more so than, than others, because um, um, of, of, the, of some of these developments that were tied, uh, uh, that, that occurred in and around the time of the survey in March of this year. Um, and, and the Korea experts like Scott probably knows um, if, you, if you sort of dial back uh, what happened uh, in the past uh, year or two. First of all, we had the December 20, I think, what, what was the first survey? It was 2016, early part of 2016, Gordon? Third quarter of 2015. 2015, exactly. So it was third quarter of 2015, which is why it's important to understand that the view in our first report, if you go back, very negative on Japan. But that shifts in 2017. And, that, and, and, and what occurred in between that time was in December 2015, there was a comfort agreement deal that was uh, brokered. Um, very important uh, watershed moment that, um, interestingly, the data shows is, is maintained the relative robustness of that bilateral relationship between um, South Korea and Japan, and that has, that has um, uh, continued all throughout 2016 and into 2017. Um, second um, was obviously the January and September 2016 uh, fourth and fifth nuclear tests in North Korea. That has also changed um, South Korean views about um, uh, sort of the, what South Korea needs to do uh, with China and the United States, how South Koreans view China. Um, there, there was also the um, uh, South Korean cooperation with the United States on uh, on missile defense uh, with the introduction of that in March of uh, 2017. But that talk already started with, um, you know, as early as the fourth and the fifth nuclear test. But understand that March of 2017 is very significant because that's when the, that's when the system was brought in. Um, um, also, um, take note of the impeachment proceedings and, you know, the scandal uh, with President Park. Uh, which was in some ways confounding that, you know, pushing that that introduction process um, forward uh, in the schedule. So all of these were very, I think, important um, in um, shaping um, what we see here. And this is, um, this is a luxury that ASEAN has, as, you, as Gordon pointed out, because, you know, Jiyun, I mean, part of the reason why I got involved in this project was because Jiyun was out for about a year and uh, there was nobody to take care of the public opinion studies. And I was the one that got lucky enough to be brought onto this project. Um, I actually, one of the few things that I thought was, um, uh, was uh, a privilege that I got to get as a result of June taking some break, um, uh, along with other burdens that I have to take on for that. Um, but, you know, we do this um, uh, favorability um, uh, survey um, quite regularly comparing how South Koreans view um, the United States, China, Japan, North Korea. Um, and as you can see, relatively uh, fairly robust view about the United States, even after the November election in 2016. Um, it's, it's taken a slight dip, but still, it's the top of the list for the South Koreans. They really like 
um, the United States. And if you ask, go into the data set that we have, um, I think you know, that shows in, the, in what the South Koreans think about whether or not the U.S. will uphold its alliance commitments in South Korea. 85% thinks that the U.S. will uphold um, its alliance commitments in South Korea. 78% support U.S. military presence on the Korean Peninsula. Uh, these are all from this particular survey in the report. 84% think that um, relations with the U.S. should either be strengthened or remain unchanged. I mean, 50% think that it should be strengthened. 34% think that it should remain unchanged. Um, so very favorable views about the United States um, overall. Um, can't say the same about China, and that takes a huge dip at, in March, as you can see. So we think that the survey perspective, and specifically on China, even though it was you know, going down very um, you know, precipitously since the fourth nuclear test, um, it, 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 it took a huge dip in, um, uh, in March when the Chinese government started to uh, criticize the South Korean government um, and also impose some, um, not formal sanctions, but um, sort of try to um, encourage um, Chinese businesses to, to not um, uh, patronize Korean businesses in China. Um, so um, the Korean response has been negative as a result of that. Um, you compare that to Japan, the Japanese response since, uh, uh, as you can see, that turning point um, in late, um, uh, towards the late part of 2015, it's been fairly, um, fairly high. Um, and uh, um, it's, it's now, uh, you know, it, 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 as of March, it was, it's, it, it was even higher than uh, for, as it was for China, which has never been the case um, in, in, during the time that we've um, surveyed. Uh, we've, we've, we've launched this survey, which goes back, I think, till 2010. Um, uh, North Korea, obviously, you know, it's getting uh, bad. It stayed uh, pretty low um, all throughout, and that's, that's um, understandable. Um, but a lot of these, a lot of these um, um, uh, sort of changes and sentiments about China in particular, I think, which was in, in our current survey and our report, um, I think was um, driven by... Um, driven by, number one, uh, the China-North Korean relationship, and two, the Chinese government reaction or pushback against the South Korea cooperation on, with the United States on, on missile defense. Um, and, and why do, um, you know, um, uh, if you, if, if there was another sort of question um, that uh, we asked um, in this survey, um, uh, that we asked to put in this survey, um, when uh, people were asked, you know, who do you think, why do you think North Korea continues to develop nuclear weapons? One of the choices was China, because China is protecting North Korea's nuclear program. Almost 66%, two-thirds of the survey respondents thought that was the reason why North Korea can continue to maintain, um, um, their, or continue their, with their nuclear development. So um, um, I think the public has a very negative view of China because of North Korea and the Chinese reaction against missile defense. Um, interestingly enough, uh, yes, uh, the, the views on the United States has, has somewhat turned a little bit more negative. Uh, but overall, um, it, the drop was not as large as it was as in, in China, as you can see from the data set. Um, uh, this was the investment question um, uh, that uh, Simon had alluded to. Um, um, in general, South Koreans, very similar to um, uh, the Japanese respondents, have a very nationalist view about um, investment on infrastructure by foreign entities. Uh, but they are even more uh, unfavorable um, about Chinese investments in South Korea, more favorable about um, the U.S. investments um, in South Korea. Um, let's see. Um, do you think the relationship between the U.S. Uh, well, if this was a Trump administration question, as uh, Simon had pointed out, uh, relatively uh, very negative outlook. Um, let's see. Uh, this was about the inter-Korean relationship on, during the Trump administration. Again, again, a negative outlook. And that's not really that surprising, okay? Because 
Um, I think that what, what we could see in our survey, you could, you could look at the favorability of the leaders, and that's a, that's a little bit of a different story than the favorability of a country. I think the South Koreans know the difference. Um, and you can, you can tell right here um, where Donald Trump's uh, favorability is about the uh, same as uh, it is for Xi Jinping, actually lower um, um, after taking office. Um, that was never the case with President Obama um, in all of the data that we've looked at. Um, it, the pres, uh, uh, Prime Minister Abe's, uh, uh, the views on Prime Minister Abe, again, um, not as favorable as it is for um, um, uh, President Xi. Uh, clearly, Kim Jong-un is the least favorable. But uh, yes, uh, so as, as uh, Simon pointed out, um, if you cue this question with Donald Trump, yes, you'll get a ne negative response. Um, but um, uh, in general, South Korean views about United States uh, is a bit more positive. Uh, so uh, there is, um, there is um, at least um, they haven't uh, quite married the two yet. They can differentiate uh, the two, which is, uh, which is uh, uh, which is nice. Um, let's see, um, the current security situation, as you can tell, um, not, uh, uh, not surprisingly, 85% um, think it's negative. Um, over the next 10 years, which country is likely to uh, start a conflict in the region? This was kind of interesting. There was a change here. Um, South Koreans thought that um, um, they were like the third largest um, instigator um, in the region. These are South Koreans thinking that they are the. Um, that's in the first report. We explain why that is. Um, I'll go into that later if you, you, you ask the question. But, but um, China wasn't quite high on that list. Now China all of a sudden becomes the second on the list. And that's, as I pointed out earlier, that's largely driven by South Korean view that, that of that, about that linkage between China and North Korea um, and also um, Chinese uh, response um, to um, the, the, the South Korean response to North Korea. So Chinese sort of reaction to South Korean response to the fourth and the fifth nuclear test and the continuing missile tests. So um, overall, uh, yes, uh, China is seen as a very influential player. If, if not already, they will, con they will become a very influential player and in fact even um, uh, replace uh, uh, the United States as a superpower in the region, and I think 56% um, see, sees it that way in South Korea. But um, they also understand that the, the fate of the peninsula doesn't lie with the Chinese. It lies more closely with um, um, the United States and the alliance, um, as, as I pointed out earlier in other measures. Um, uh, so yes, again, very similar to Australia. South Koreans think that increased trade with China is good for South Korea. 45% think so. 50% um, of, of South Koreans think that um, um, relations with China should be better. Um, but again, um, they would rather have better relations with the United States if, if um, that was the choice. Um, they also see both China and the United States as indispensable for Korea's reunification. Uh, uh, about 45% think so for China, 43% think so about the United States role. Um, so, so, so overall, yeah, there was a change uh, from the last survey uh, in the rise in negative sentiments about China and the risks that uh, China poses to South Korea's national security. And again, that was largely, I think, driven by um, the, the, the tests uh, in North Korea and also by the Chinese reaction um, to um, the measures that South Korea has taken um, against that. Thank you, James. We'll turn to, to, to you. Thank you, Gordon. Um, can everyone hear me? Um, thank you for uh, Gordon and uh, Simon to host, um, host uh, to invite me to uh, come up uh, come up and do this again uh, this year. And uh, thank you, James, for the shout out for Stimson. Um, Stimson, I think, also the super of gratitude for your partnership and uh, collaboration. So um, I wear two hats here, I think. Um, first, obviously, as a director of Japan program here at Stimson, but I also have a non-resident uh, senior fellow status at the Canon Institute of Global Studies. And I realized that the, my, who I called uh, my boss in Tokyo, Kuni Miyake, actually wrote the Japan portion of it. 
I can do my best job to channel my inner Kunimiyake, but which is kind of impossible <laughs> job to do. Because he's kind of like a Jedi-ish figure in us, amongst us so, all. Yeah. So <laughs> I don't play saxophone, no. So, so what, um, despite my intent, I would not be able to do so. However, I can try to um, um, analyze and see what he was getting at in his section of it. So what I would like to do today in a brief period of time, um, I would like to do two things mainly. One, I would like to touch upon the um, main takeaways that we seem to have extrapolated from the sur uh, survey data. And uh, I would like to uh, interpret that in my own way. So uh, we're just going to have to see if I can still maintain my job after this presentation. So I'll, I'll keep you posted on that as well. So main takeaway that uh, Kuni uh, uh, extrapolated from this survey, first and foremost, very sharp drop in the uh, on the uh, Japanese perception of uh, U.S. influence in Asia, almost, almost uh, actually slightly over a 30% drop from the uh, last survey. That's one. Second, that said, um, when it comes to longer term uh, perception of uh, influence in Asia, it didn't dip as much, just about a 5% drop. And I would get that. Uh, I would I would get to that discrepancy, seeming discrepancy, a little bit later on. Thirdly. Um, slight uh, dip in the uh, number uh, in the survey data in amongst those uh, in Japan who identifies uh, China as the uh, most influential country uh, both today and in 10 years. And this number, uh, point number two and then number three that I just uh, men uh, mentioned closely, I think, correlates with their own perception of Japan's expanding um, influence in the uh, region. And fourth, uh, they, uh, people in Japan uh, seem, to, seem to see that challenges that the United States has is uh, greater in its in internal issues, such as uh, uh, racial divide, um, economic situation, and other politically divisive issues here within the United States, rather than external uh, security threats. Fifth, Slight, uh, slight uptick on the uh, number, overall numbers of uh, U.S. Uh, does more harm than good, and which is which is kind, uh, which cannot be um, underestimated because if you look at the uh, survey data, I hope you all have the uh, chance to read um, read the actual report. Um, back in the uh, survey in the uh, 2015, uh, about 27% of the uh, Japanese respondents said. United States does more good than harm. In this year's survey, however, um, that number um, actually show a noticeable dip by 7%. So 20% as opposed to 27 in about a um, little over a year ago seem to think that the Japan, um, United States does more good than harm in the region. And last but not least, um, Japan has the overall um, overwhelming unwillingness to see China as the uh, alternative superpower in the region. And I'll, this, this uh, number is really stark when you look at the uh, survey data across the board at the, in the report. And I'll come back to that as well. So what does this uh, six main takeaways all, could all mean? Uh, first and foremost, uh, this is why I think uh, the result of this study next year will be very, very interesting because the poll was taken in March 2017. So. People in Japan were still in that initial Trump shock with uh, immigration, um, executive order, uh, withdrawal from TPP. So what they uh, are afraid of what Trumpism uh, could be seemed to have kind of come all to the fore within that first 90 days in the office. And by the time that next survey will be taken in 2018, people have seen about a year of uh, Trump administration and how they handled Asia policy, national security. It could be good, but it could be really bad. But um, it's, a, it's a question that are still out there, so I think that makes it makes a next year survey result really important to watch. So in the short term, so that what does mean is that the impact of the uh, Trump administration in in the uh, perception, in, amongst the uh, people's, uh, people in Japan's perception, is really not to be uh, underestimated. It, it, actually, it actually does have a substantial um, impact on how they perceive today's America. But at the same time, this is where Japanese, um, what I might call um, 
embedded DNA of um, recognizing United States being their ultimate security guarantor kicks in, that when, it, when you extrapolate that in longer term, in a 10 years term, their confidence dips a little bit, but not by much. And that also leads to several um, poll survey data results that actually appears to be a little bit contradictory. So on one hand, on the short term, Japan, um, the survey data shows that people in Japan seem to think that uh, US uh, influence in Asia diminished by quite substantial margin. But then at the same time, like I said, only slight dip in the long term US influence in Asia. And also not identifying China as the uh, alternative superpower. And uh, there was another, one other result that I showed me that, was, that I thought was uh, quite interesting, but I, it, it's, it's in the data somewhere. But those, those are kind of a sub, they're, they're, those are contradicting from each other. So that's when, that's where I, and then also they do have a high, relatively high confidence in the uh, US alliance commitment to defend Japan. And this is both today and in long term. So how would you explain that gap? If you are to believe that US influence in Asia is dropping by substantial margin, how could, you, how could 70, still 73% of the poll, you know, poll respondent could say that, yes, we are still confident in the US ability to them? ability to honor its uh, defense commitment in the alliance. So that is one inc um, interesting gap that I noticed on this poll results. And also, the, uh, one of the takeaway that the CUNY highlighted was the uh, uh, increase of the uh, number of uh, people who, who seem to have thought, who seem to think that the Japan's own influence in Asia seem to be growing. And I think they, uh, they are a very, this, view, um, I believe, is very much uh, influenced by the uh, Prime Minister Abe as a host of diplomatic initiatives since he came into the office, most noticeably um, proactive contribution, contribution to international peace, more robust engagement with Southeast Asian countries, more robust engagement with India and Australia, so other uh, U.S. security allies and partners in the region, and uh, with, uh, with Korea, like uh, James alluded to, since the uh, Comfort Women Agreement has been brokered. And, uh, but um, I, this is why um, Simon's, uh, Simon's initial remarks about this, uh, you know, 50% of the uh, poll surveyors were fed in with the other premise, although the uh, uh, following question was identical. This is where I would think this is not, you know, this is only applicable to Japan, so it's not methodology-wise, it's, um, it's, um, it's not quite possible for this study's purposes, but I would be very much interested in seeing the poll results with the same wording of the question, but it's premised by Japan is rapidly aging, Japan's economy is only sluggishly moving, and by the way, Japan's national debt is even worse situation than the United States, and the question. So basically, reminding people in Japan of it's the called, limit. It's called the leading question. Right, I mean, <laughs> it's, you know, limitation, um, the limitation of their own countries, and would they still be just as confident about their role in international space or role in Asia? Um, and like, like Gordon said, you know, it is, it is called a leading question, so it's not a, it's not a you know, methodological, it's, not, it's, not really, it's probably not a very sound methodology, but as an intellectual curiosity, I would, think, I I would be really interested to know, um, even if the uh, core question is the same, would that uh, produce a remarkably different results. And uh, finally, the, uh, what I just meant, what I refer to as uh, their uh, ingrained DNA on the dependence on the United States as its ultimate security guarantor, really comes out starkly, starkly by their overwhelming unwillingness to see China as the alternative superpower. They don't, uh, they don't, they're, they don't perceive the uh, investment uh, by China uh, positively. They don't believe um, China, China will replace the uh, United States in Asia. And that difference is very stark between J Japan on the one hand and the rest of the countries that are, pulled, that are surveyed in this poll. So that's, uh, that will be my, um, that's, 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 that's uh, amongst anything else, I think that's probably what I, uh, what I 
what I, what I found was increased, uh, extremely fascinating. So with that, um, I know Yoon is uh, in waiting in a clean hit, so. Yoon, last but certainly not least, we'll turn to you for your insights. Um, so I, I used to work for Yuki many years ago, as I used to work for Gordon many years ago, so really an honor to be here. Um, when I look at the China section, I, uh, based on the data, I have three main takeaways or three main conclusions. The first one is um, the Chinese has this exuberant confidence about their future. If you look at the data, 76% of the respondents in China believe that China will be the superpower and 65% of them believe that China will replace the United States in the, in the region. So these are exceedingly high, it's higher than the, than the data from last year. And these views are largely different from the views of, uh, from the region, like only Australia identifies with that Chinese conclusion, and all other countries just disagree. Um, the second conclusion, uh, takeaway that I have from the data